The following episode of The Unseen Hour was recorded on the 28th of October 2018 as part of the London Horror Festival at the Old Red Lion in London Islington. As such, it was affected by the malign influences of a number of restless spirits, minor demons, ominous planets, and one particular deathless sorcerer, emperor, god, king, who shall remain nameless. As a result, instead of the usual six coherent and immaculate audio files, the recording produced 46 pints of warm, spongy tissue. It seemed that the episode was a write-off. But that was when our friend, comedian Nick Lamont, recommended Resubstantiates. Resubstantiates is a new data recovery service that specializes in the reconstruction of information which has spontaneously transgressed orders of reality. Our friend Nick first used Resubstantiates when she arrived at a theater to find that her long-running sketch comedy show was a two-bedroom Victorian terraced flat in Scarborough, which, while attractive and surprisingly energy efficient, had poor transport links and was, crucially, unable to entrance a room of 88 drama students and fashionable horror comedy nostalgiacs. While that night's entertainment was sadly cancelled, the following night, Nick was able to take the stage with utter confidence. All she had to do was coat her Scarborough residence with resubstantiated palatable jelly and allow it to consume her with one of the resultant mouths. When she awoke, her theatre piece was, if possible, even more charming than previously. The process works just the same whether your DVD copy of Bruce MacDonald's modern horror classic Pontypool is now the reflection of an empty room. The reason you came into the kitchen just now has transformed into an ice sculpture bust of X-ray crystallographer Rosalind Franklin, or you return from the smoking area to find that the remaining two-thirds of your two-thirds of a pint, that's approximately four-tenths of a pint, has become the footprint of a child in the freshly turned soil of a Vietnamese rice field observed by a GI in the first glimmer of dawn, April 20th, 1961. Simply coat with the jelly and allow it to ingest you. All this is to say that the episode you are about to hear is restored slightly imperfectly, while being swallowed whole by 46 pints of undifferentiated yet observably sensate parenchymal tissue might be an unavoidable occurrence for you, dear listeners. For reasons that need not trouble you, it should not be possible for me, and indicates something far more cataclysmic. We hope that it does not diminish your enjoyment that the sound quality is not to our usual standard, or that this is a Halloween and Christmas episode released in late January. We assure you that subsequent episodes will not be affected, should you still have the capacity to hear them. We hope you will join us, if you can, for our final live show at Vault Festival this coming Saturday, the 26th of January at 4.30pm. And we hope that you will choose Resubstantiates when your own grip on the modalities of the substantial begins to slip. Shut your eyes. Stop your ears. Give nothing away. They are watching. They notice the tiniest of micro-expressions. They judge. They can see your weaknesses, your failings, be they physical, moral, emotional, and they will expose you at the unseen hour. When we left our heroes, they had discovered, in a rather static final showdown, that a flesh-melting virus codenamed Captain Fox had been loosed on an unsuspecting populace, carried invisibly by men and inflicting an unspeakable destruction on women. There is no way of telling how far the disease has gone until its deadly effects are revealed. Much as the insane villainy of the director of the Institute for Unethical Practices has been revealed, as he continues to cackle at his own deviousness. <laughs> That's right. Uh, there is no going back. You thought masculinity was threatening before. Now it could agonizingly reduce you to pink foam in a matter of moments. And any one of us could be a carrier. Even young Strideforth here, uh, Strideforth here, barely at the cusp of manhood and yet clearly, clearly deep. Deep into puberty. (laughs) My work here is done and I escaped to build my new society. (laughs) Um, uh, 
Sh- should we have stopped him? He's done all he can do now. But he's right, Strideforth. You could be infected. We wouldn't know. I'm pretty sure I'm not infected. You wouldn't know. I'm pretty sure. We I'm not. can't afford to take the risk. Uh, Feels sort of like you're both ganging up on me a bit here now. Well, I'd say it's really not like that because there's like a yeah, flesh really not like that. in this situation. I think I'm the victim. I I'm, no, I, I'm no, the victim. No, no, I'm pretty. No. I'm the victim. Maybe if you just put on this hazmat suit. If I'm yeah. infected, surely I'm the. I, I'm claustrophobic, damn it! It also, it, it smells. Look at it. It smells all. It's not really my thing. But it would be safer for everyone. Oh, fine. Well, I guess if everyone knows it'd be safer. <laughs> Is this, is this a contraceptive metaphor? It's not a metaphor! Um, Our flesh could literally melt, you selfish dick! Unless it is a metaphor. I, I mean, what is our existence but a cycle of patterns? Uh, stacking fractals of social symbolism, uh, reflecting what uh, our own natures, and, and, and for what purpose? Uh, it's all right, Dr. Perch. Oh, I'm sorry, it was fine when it was typhoid Mary, wasn't it? Besides, I won't be sealed inside a plastic... Ah! Oh! No, you won't catch me! Oh. I won't be sealed! Oh, you won't... Oh, dear! Another radicalized youth has run from me! Oh, no! He's come back. Let us in! The world has gone mad! You've got to pause! We're not safe from this terrible disease! That's what we're calling men now! Ha! <laughs> Oh, you've got the laugh. It's the apocalypse. We also thought we'd call on you because it's nice to have some company at this time of year, isn't it? What's going on out there? Well, it's Christmas. Or New New Year, maybe. (laughs) Halloween. I don't know. But society has collapsed. I was keeping an eye on your Twitter, and of course you were live-twitting that whole conclusion of previous episodes. So then the word got out and everyone went bananas. I mean, a gal had to be careful before, but uh, now even a handshake can dissolve you into a fine raspberry mousse. (laughs) And this was a point when I knew, dear listeners, the point when I knew that I had to take charge. No madcap farce or pseudo-action horror was going to cut it this time. There had to be a reason I was brought back after 38 episodes away. (laughs) I brought in the reclusive scientist Featherstone as an expert witness. And if there was going to be any chance of survival, I knew we needed everyone. So as you will see, I went out and arraigned all the men. Scooped them up in this big monologue. (laughs) This is Frankie Jessup, and you're listening to episode three of Unobserved, The Disappearance of Lisa Clements. Sponsored by Zip Recruiter. (laughs) The police may have stopped searching the woods around Wentworth Observatory, but Lisa's mother, Fiona, is here every weekend. She takes her dog. Together they walk the woodland, searching for Lisa. Half of her hopes to find something, half doesn't. Half... She talks about her daughter as we walk. No one was more surprised than Fiona when Lisa, two years ago, traded in a life of high-flying university posts to work at the quiet and remote observatory. A place less cutting-edge than... blunt surface. The only remarkable feature was its Victorian refracting telescope, which drew enthusiasts from miles around. It had drawn Lisa, too. Months later... She disappeared. And officially, Lisa's job was tracking orbits of Jupiter's moons. That month, she was charting the irregular and constantly changing orbit of Lysithia. But according to colleague Roy Dean, she showed little interest in the work. The refracting telescope was her passion project. She wanted to restore it. She wanted to look at the stars through its lens. But what is a refracting telescope? For Patreon backers, I have an exclusive episode all about the fascinating history of this device. Sign up as a backer today for tons of extra episodes and other goodies. Lisa vanished four months ago. This fifth episode, I'm speaking with people who saw her last. 
starting with Roy. The telescope is beautiful. It takes my breath away. Brass casing, ornate designs, and the lens in it. The lens was... It drew me in. I'm in her office looking over her notes. They seem disturbed. The police think she was not of sound mind looking at these pages. I agree. Scrawls, diagrams, underlining, a lot of it is concerned with the telescope. Detailed drawings, crossings out and edits. There are pages and pages of formulas, mathematical equations. She wrote a lot about making her own lenses. Many times she writes, find the perfect edge. And on the last page, the day she disappeared, one phrase is underlined. Refract the light until it breaks. This is Frankie Jessup, and I'm recording this episode of Unobserved ahead of schedule because some new information has come to light. Lisa is not the first person to go missing from Wentworth Observatory. Philip Myers did in 1932. George Kors in 68. Both were researchers like Lisa. Both were never found. I've just come from the observatory. I wanted to speak to Roy. Did he know about this? Did he keep it from me? But his colleagues say he hasn't been seen for days. I'm beginning to worry that he... I'm sorry for the silence from me over the last three weeks. The recordings from episode seven have been taken from me. Evidence. I'll explain. When I got back to my hotel room, someone was already there. Roy. He was stealing Lisa's notebooks. I tried to stop him, but... The last time anyone has seen him was later that day. He was driving up the hill to the observatory. His car is still there. He is not. I've been told to stop, but I can't. There's something in those notebooks, something in Lisa's research, something in that observatory that's making people... No. I'm sorry, everyone. This has gotten too real. I have to stop. This is Frankie Jessup, signing off. This is Frankie Jessup, and you're listening to Unobserved, a special bonus episode. Maybe the last. It's 2am. I'm in Wentworth Observatory. I'm here for one reason. The telescope. It all makes sense now. Lisa only disappeared after she started to restore it. Roy disappeared after he took her notes. The others in the past, they must have been using it too. There's something in the telescope. Police wouldn't listen to me, but I know. I know the answer. And this recording will show I'm right. And is anyone there? Hello? Sorry. I'm nervous. This telescope. There's always been something strange about it. Some quality. The hairs on my arms stand up. It's cold in here. My breath fogs up the lens, but immediately it clears. What is it about the glass? Why does it draw me to it? Like it drew Philip, George, Roy, and... and... Lisa? There's a photograph of Lisa inside the lens. That wasn't there before. It's blurry. If I just... If I focus it... <gasps> it's not her! She's there! And she's... She's banging on the lens! Lisa! I have to open it and get her out! She's in agony! I see it now! She's split into pieces! Refracted and... Oh God! Somebody! <laughs> Those are the last recordings that were found. My name is John Byborn, and you're listening to Procedural, the podcast that looks into the disappearance of Frankie Jessup. <laughs> we'll solve a mystery, no matter what it takes. Sign up to our Patreon today. <laughs> Thank you.
First of all, thank you so much, all of you, for joining us. You didn't give us much choice. No, I move that that wicked fella don't be allowed to speak words anymore. Okay, so... (laughs) Yeah? I've heard you. Uh, Director Grick, you will please restrict yourself to answering direct questions. Uh, Now, Dr. Featherstone. What's that? You worked here at the Institute for Unethical Practices. Yeah. I was Greek sidekick and confidant back in the good old days. Uh, But when things started to get dark and weird, I wouldn't stand for it and I got pushed out. But you do know a bit about this virus. Yeah, I saw its early development. It's a really evil piece of work. I only saw the final product when you came and showed it to me, but I don't suppose you want me to go into all the chemical stuff. I can do that. I mean, no, not really, unless it will actually help us cure this thing. Not a chance. (laughs) No, no cure for this. It's extinction in a bottle. Man or woman, once it gets you, you're got. Wow. <laughs> and uh, what about diagnosis? Well, it seems to have been engineered to interact specifically to affect only the dominant gender identities, which, good news for me at least. Women, you can quickly tell if they've got it, but men, allow me to show you with this sample of the virus. Yeah, that's me, hello. I'm the virus. I mean... Yeah, sorry about all this. Uh, doesn't seem like so much fun now. I was just happily getting on, you know, uh, replicating myself, doing my thing, living my life. Didn't realize I was going to cause all this trouble. Bit about me there, in case you were wondering. <laughs> Good news, though. Haven't made the jump to animals. So uh, I'm going out with the human race. Silver linings and all that. Um, so is there any way to tell if a man is a carrier? Well, I'm pretty sneaky about that. It's a very faint chemical change in the blood, undetectable. But it does alter the behavior somewhat. In extreme cases, that might be like shouting, crying, and uh, uncontrollable sniffing. Uh, might have seen some of that somewhere recently, I don't know. But... Uh, More usually, it's just a case of increased sense of entitlement, heightened aggression, or just kind of obliviousness. All of which helped me to replicate, uh, but is more or less indistinguishable from normal behavior. All right, then. Uh, Maybe we can interview to screen people. Okay, I'm I'm really pretty sure I'm not infected, but but, but, interviewing for odd behavior only gives results on a range of... Probably infected to don't know. I mean, it's the best we have, Smarty Pants, so... Is Actually, that there may be another way. No, 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 Imogen, don't. I didn't want to resort to it, but I don't understand how I participated in the creation of this thing. I knew what I was doing, and I, I, I didn't object. Why, why didn't I... You, you, you can help us now. No, it, it would be more infection, more death. Wait, what, what is it? All right. There's another virus. Opportunistic overadded exacerbator of encephalotropic organomegolic ineric omphalomycosis. Oh, you uh, it's, it's a difficult one. It was a very impressive one. It, it piggybacks on the first virus. Don't ask me to say it again. <laughs> it does what now? It, it reacts with it. <laughs> Uh, causes the symptoms to manifest the same across gender. Well, that, that's perfect. It'll take out anyone who's infected and the virus will be gone. Listen to yourself, Rufus. Take them out. Think about what that would look like. It's inhumane. The symptoms are extremely painful. I, I would guess at least half of these men are already infected. Okay, so that would be an extreme solution, a last resort. We'll just carefully set that aside here, possibly for later. First, we should try cross-examination. So, let's start with Mr. Kent. <laughs> oh, God! Oh, I'm innocent! Oh, I never hurt anyone! Okay, well, all the same, we don't know... I mean, I don't know, maybe your friend Yadchek has something to say about this. I was distracted! <laughs> well, Yadchek, someone you care about very much might be cross-examined and then eradicated, so... Kent! Maybe pay some attention. Yes, exactly. I was, I was doing a puzzle in the corner. <laughs> I was, 
I needed I a drink, it. and then there was a puzzle. That's I thought a, I would go. I know it's a kid. No, but not kid. Like I can vouch for him. Uh, only just now, recently, outside, after you interrupted us nearly touching each other, uh, we did, in fact, touch each other, and nothing. He was not infected. <gasps> Ah, oh, yes, you see, it's preposterous. I'm clean as a whistle. All the same, we don't know what has happened in the meantime. Look, oh, no, I'll prove it. Uh, give me your hand, kid. No! no! Oh, God. Oh, 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 God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, what have I done? Oh, oh yeah, Chuck, I'm so oh. sorry. Oh, so much of it. So disgusting. <laughs> uh, Mr. Kent, you, oh you better go and sit apart by Grick. We'll make that area into the quarantine zone. <laughs> my, my poor young chick. She, she didn't deserve this. Uh, uh, I can oh. keep at living if you need well, me. To. <laughs> probably next. And, uh, uh, given my advanced years and uh, the seriousness of this situation, it does seem to have got a lot more serious than it usually does. Uh, I'd like to go into voluntary quarantine. Goodbye, sob. I'll write to you. Oh, Flem, you're a sweetheart. I love you. And you know what? We'll always have old faithful Strumster Tom Moores. <laughs> such esteem so I can look towards the sky and say that I'm for real so I can stand inside this man as my skin begins to peel I can stand and say that I'm for real Jemima, sorry. <laughs> yes, okay. Uh, I, uh, I know this isn't going to be exact. I'm not sure exactly how to cross-examine you here, and the only way we'll ever be 100% sure you're not infected is by using another human life as like a litmus test. Yes, yes, let's, let's, let's please not do that. You know, if this weren't reality, which of course it is. Of course it's reality. It, it might seem like a clumsy and potentially offensive sci-fi horror conceit parodying the spread of a real disease like HPV, or, I mean, uh, equally bad taste, the ubiquity of rape culture. Only, only why, why would you need to stand in for those things? This, 
This lab-grown super virus is horrific, of course, but compared to something that has real deep roots in modern society, I mean, c compared to, to anything that is truly <laughs> painful and damaging, but woven into the fabric of our culture, you know, steeped in shame or carrying some pointless but indelible stigma, compared to something like that, this, this virus is just a, a stupid cardboard cutout over a pub in London. <laughs> Thank you. It's the right sort of silhouette to be disturbing, but it, it's, a, it's a defanged simulacrum of the deep horror that it represents. What's the point? Who's listening? I mean, I don't know, but maybe we've gone past the point where we need stand-ins like that. Once they were useful to sidestep taboos, but now, well, we're supposed to be able to say what we mean, right? I think so. At least we should be able to judge for ourselves what's a good thing to think and say, rather than being stopped by some external fashionable sensor. Is that what you feel? That you can vouch for your own integrity? Honestly? I'm afraid. And not afraid as in, it's a scary time for young men. If young men are afraid of being held to account, they're missing the point. The, re the real thing is to be afraid. The real thing to be afraid of is that you're not who you think you are. I'm Rufus Strideforth! I'm, I'm, a, I'm a hero! A protagonist! I exist in direct opposition to monsters like Grick over there. I know my intentions are good by definition. I want to say I'm confident in my actions because of that. I, I like to, to bluster an old court. You know, charge onwards and tell it like it is. Do what I want! But what if I'm missing some important information? What if I'm not perceiving the world as it really is? If this virus has wheedled its way into my brain, I trust my senses for what they are. But who would be fool enough to think they had the whole picture? Who could possibly think they were right? So in the end, I don't trust that I'm, I'm pure and good. I know I'm not a monster, but you don't have to be a monster to carry the seed of destruction and to spread it. Everybody loves to crucify people, it's just some people like to crucify different demographics. Are you really above all that? You can do that whatever your intentions are. However woke, as we kids say, <laughs> you think you are. So I, I, I don't know. Can I volunteer for quarantine as well? Well, uh, actually, I don't think you can. No offense to the adorable old man who just did that, but it's kind of a cowardly and irresponsible thing to just duck out of the whole discussion, much mm. as it might be pretty great to move forward into a post-apocalyptic matriarchy where male characters don't get quite as much airtime in stories about redressing the gender imbalance. Yeah, crucify them. <laughs> yeah, that was a good one. I mean, I think there might be some reproductive sustainability issues in an all-female society, Unless, uh, Featherstone, how is mad science doing with the test tube babies? Uh, yeah, we're not there yet. Okay, well, it was a nice idea. Um, but I don't have the answer to this. It's a stupid, ill-fitting sci-fi premise anyway. I mean, is it trying to say that all men who exhibit toxic behavior are actually innocent, victimized patsies who just have the best of intentions? That's just not true. It, it is a metaphor. It's first part, a first part and a second. A syllogism in three parts. It, it doesn't make sense before the final synthesis. Oh, Imogen. No, no, she, she, she doesn't look right at all. Infection is the thesis. I interrogation is the antithesis. The synthesis must be imposed equality. No, Imogen, stay away from that bottle. Oh, 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 no, no, no. Oh, bollocks. <laughs> She's released. <laughs> Opportunistic, overrated exacerbator of encephalotropic organomegatic oniric omphalomycosis. Ooh, ee, ooh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now there's going to be. Oh my god, Rufus. He was infected. All of them were. They all had it. Not quite all. Yes, I, I took precautions, of course. I wouldn't go and infect myself. No, it can't end like this. What did you expect? It's a horror show. It's Halloween. Even if it's Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> when you're, whenever you're listening to this, and no, none of, none of them deserved this. None of you did either. 
No, there is no comeuppance. No, no poetic justice here. No, nothing. There's no requirement for this to be a comforting story. The, the good ones don't win. The wrong people always get the last word. There is meaning, and then meaninglessness. So it has been told to us. So it has been told to us. And so it was told to them. And so it is. One thing leads to another. Comparisons, dissonance, syllogisms. We look, we compare, we spot the differences, we read a structure and find meaning, or we dismiss it as indulgent rambling until some final piece falls into place and we realize that it all did make sense and was very funny and moving. <laughs> as we trust that it will at the next Unseen Hour. We hope that you related to The Unseen Hour, episode 46, The Bechdel Kampf Test. <laughs> the Unseen Hour is recorded live and monthly. For live shows, see unseenhour.com. This episode was recorded at the Old Red Lion as part of the London Horror Festival. It was performed very seriously by Deborah Pearson, Bryce Stratford, Joey Timmons, and James Carney, and featured a monologue written by James Huntrods and performed by Danielle Winter with James Hunterrods breaking the rules of monologue. <laughs> the musical guest was... Wait, Tom Moores. The musical <laughs> wait, guest Tom was Tom... Moores. Was Wait, Tom Moores. Uh, <laughs> Tom Waits Moores. <laughs> the music with the unrecorded. The Unseen Hour is an Unseen Things production created, written, and produced by James Carney, and the podcast is produced medicinally by Ella Watts. Uh, and in this episode in particular by literal human blessing Headley Knight to whom I owe many favours now and we have fond memories of Andy Goddard to support the show in various ways go to unseenhour.com we all look forward to seeing you here again at the next Unseen Hour